Hello Sector Watchers, welcome to the show. This is the 184th episode of Sector Spotlight for Monday the 17th of July and I'm recording this during US market hours. My name is Julius de Campenaar and I'm presenting to you from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Let's get started right away and take a look at some of the movements that we are currently seeing in the asset classes universe. Taking a quick look at the RRG for asset classes and we see how Bitcoin is still deep down in the weakening quadrant at you know, relatively low uh, relative momentum. But it's leveling off right now and there is plenty of room for Bitcoin to curl back up and make a move towards the leading quadrant. We're not there yet, but <laughs> it's still very well uh, possible. We'll take a look at the Bitcoin chart in a minute. If I take this off and reset the chart, we got a better handle on the other asset classes and obviously the most important one being this being stock spy. You can see how it is rotating, rolling over very gently over the last few weeks, indicating that the, um, the rally is running into some relative doldrums, so to say. Uh, it's not entirely negative because we're still moving higher on the RS ratio scale, which means that we're still picking up relative strength, but it's just going at a, it's still, and it's still going at a positive momentum, but that momentum is declining a little bit. So it's, it's all still good, but it's not as good as it was like three weeks ago. Um, the commodity ETFs, DJP and GSG, they are making quite a um, sharp move back up. So you can see how they jump back up. Um, that's something to be aware of, but they're at very low at the RS ratio scale, so I'm not going to pay much attention to them. And when you look at the three fixed income uh, asset classes, you will see that they are inside the lagging quadrant, moving lower on the RS ratio scale. So that's opposite to what's happening in stocks. And you see that they are just picking up a little bit. So stocks and bonds are, you know, they're, they're still going in the right direction, or at least um, in favor of stocks over bonds, but the pace is slowing down a little bit. I think the most important tail to watch right now on the asset class RRG is for the US dollar, because where it was kind of moving up, you can see that over the last four or five weeks, things started to deteriorate and the US dollar is now uh, moving back down towards the lagging quadrant. And that's the chart that I want to start with uh, on the on the regular charts. And, and it's, this is the US dollar chart. So the US dollar index, um, which is the one that we have on the RRG here. And to be honest, this chart just hurts my eyes. This is such an important break lower. Um, we were looking for support in that 100 area. And for quite some time, it, it looked as if it would manage. And then last week, we've got this vicious decline that just, you know, like a knife through warm water is sliding through and it's now resting um, 99, 60, 99, 61. You can see how that is a, um, a, a minor previous high seems to be serving as resistance right now. So we could see a bounce, but that former support level, that 100 level, 101 is now a super, super important resistance level. So, um, the approach, the trading approach from being looking for buying opportunities uh, has now shifted and basically turned around in looking for selling opportunities on any bounce. If you look at the uh, move of the dollar index versus VBINX, which is the benchmark of our RRG right here, you can see how that has started to break down and continue or start well, I think it's continued. This was a very shallow decline, uh, lower highs and lower lows in the relative strength line. So unfortunately, not a, not a lot of good things happening for the US dollar, but you could argue that that is a good reason for people to invest in the US and could be good for the US stock market. When we translate that to Euro dollar, then you can see how this is obviously uh, reversed. So it's the Euro expressed in US dollar. So when this goes up, it's strong for the Euro and it's weak for the dollar and it completely underscores, confirms what we just saw in the dollar index that um, 110, 111 area, we've discussed it many times here in Sector Spotlight, was a major resistance level. That 
gave way as if it didn't exist last week. And I think that the next target is now around 115, 115. And even the shallow potential negative divergence that, that was building up over the last months has now been broken to the upside. So that has been negated as a potential source of price pressure. And if we look at that on the daily chart, then you can see how that goes even stronger. You can see how it's breaking out at 111, 110, 96 <clears throat> and pushing higher. And here you can see how the daily RSI is pushing to new highs. It's the highest level actually for two years right now. Um, so there's no negative divergence whatsoever. And we know that an RSI at high levels is just an indication of a very strong market. Um, as a little bit of a platform feature, I'd like to point out, maybe you know it already, but since not too long, we already have, we also have intraday data for uh, currencies. So you could look at, for example, and I like um, a four hour chart for currencies um, because that is about six, the currencies trade 24 hours a day. So when you look at a four hour chart, you're looking at six bars per period of 24 hours. That's kind of like the relationship of a daily and a weekly chart when you would look at stocks. Um, what you can see here is that <clears throat> over the last, so since Friday, um, you can see that we're having this sort of sideways movement here. Uh, this could be argued as being a negative divergence, so that could be a little bit of a setback. Um, I think for the real short-term traders among you, if you trade currencies, you'll be looking for a drop below 112 uh, and then maybe get a new buying opportunity when it comes back to 110, 111. But that's for the really shorter-term traders if you're interested in that. Let's move to, uh, to stocks, to the rotation of SPY that we've seen here. <clears throat> and you can see how um, SPY has reached the resistance zone, the, resist the resistance area that we've been discussing here at Sector Spotlight uh, for quite some time. So it'll be interesting to see how we're going to behave right here uh, while we're in that resistance zone. The top of that zone is somewhere around, you can see here, 452.7 is, is this high here. So let's say that that's the top of the range. Let's say 452 spot 7. Uh, and the bottom of that range, I would put it at 447.5. So right now, we're right in the middle of that resistance zone. Um, obviously, when we push higher, when we push above that 452.7, the next and ultimate target is the all-time high at 468.8. <clears throat> Breaking that would, would really be a very strong sign for the S&P 500. Um, we're not there yet. I, I'm a guy that likes to take it step by step. So we're working our way higher. And every time we look for um, gradual new resistance areas and we make a new assessment when the market arrives at those levels. Um, so right now, uh, wait and see again. So we, 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 we kind of picked up this move higher. Um, it's still ongoing, higher highs, higher lows on that weekly bar chart. So that trend is very, very healthy. Uh, looks as if the divergence that was building up here is now breaking. If you look at the MACD, that is super positive. So, you know, for SPY, everything is still in the green. From a relative perspective, we may see some sort of a pause or a little decline maybe in the next couple of days, weeks, I don't know. But um, it's all within the bigger picture, within the bigger framework of a strong stock market. If we look uh, at the daily chart, then we, last week we discussed that negative divergence as a possible short-term um, pressure indicator. Well, that didn't work. Like immediately thereafter, uh, the market sort of took out that high here. It sort of negated that negative divergence and is pushing higher as we just saw on that weekly chart. So uh, the negative price pressure that, that could have been argued coming from that negative divergence in the RSI has been taken off the table. Uh, and it's now actually turning into a positive thing. All in all, that results in a very strong, still very strong uh, chart for the ratio of SPY versus IEF, that is stocks versus bonds. Uh, we're still pushing higher, still pushing into, into un further into uncharted territory. Um, and right now, there's no real reason to, uh, to think or to argue that this is going to turn around anytime soon. 
Let's quickly move to Bitcoin. Um, <clears throat> obviously still struggling with that overhead resistance. And if you look at this is the weekly chart uh, on a uh, log scale, and you can see how rough these edges are, how rough these levels are. Uh, this is the 30, 31 K area. Uh, so Bitcoin, US dollar 30 to 31 being a super heavy resistance area. Uh, and, and we still haven't been able to break higher. If we take that to the daily chart, we see we got a little bit better perspective. Uh, we're moving sideways since uh, 21, 22nd of June, and we've tested 31.4, 31.5 with a uh, extreme level at 31.8. So I'm kind of inclined to say that the resistance level for Bitcoin has now been set and pegged around 31 and a half. That's a little up from the 30K that we're looking at. So it becomes more pronounced if you look at a shorter term chart. And the lower boundary here is 29.6. If we go below 29.6, that is a signal by the market that it needs a little bit more time to refuel. It's not going to negate the still positive outlook for Bitcoin. It's just going to tell you that there is uh, more time needed to accumulate the buying power to push it eventually above 31.5, 32. Uh, so for Bitcoin, it's still um, quite a crucial level. If we break higher, that would be confirming that longer term uptrend. Uh, or, or uh, getting out of that long-term bottom formation, that longer-term uh, base. If we break below 29 and a half, it's a signal that we need more time to do that. I don't think that'll be a signal for this whole thing to turn around and start moving lower. Um, the, the, the real next important support level, if we ever get there within the foreseeable future, I think is 25,000. That was the level to watch on the upside when we were breaking it. That happened. It, it came back as support. We jumped from there and now we're working our way higher, trying to take out 31 and a half. So that 25K area, uh, I think, will start to serve as a very strong support level. But quite frankly, um, I'd be surprised if we get there within the next few months. Negative divergence here is signaling that that pause, that potential turnaround that I just mentioned. Um, in, if that happens, 28 and a half, that's the, uh, that's the level right here, is something that I would be looking for. What's happening in sector rotation at the moment? We have the weekly RRG for the S&P sectors on the left. But before I start talking about that, I want to dive into two call it breath indicators, macroeconomic indicators. Um, the first one being the new 52 week highs. And as you can see, that number has been steadily growing um, after a dip in April, March, March, April. And it's now uh, on the rise. That is supportive of um, increasing breadth in the market. So the, the participation of stocks in the market that drive the S&P higher is increasing. That's a good thing. And you can see the price of the S&P in the back here, the blue line, that's the S&P itself. And also that um, moving average, it's a 13 week moving average. So one quarter uh, has started to rise. Uh, so all in all, that, that increasing number of new 52 week highs I take that as a positive for the market as a whole. If we look at the VIX, you can see that it remains at, a, at I'd, I'd say, extremely low levels. I mean, I remember a time where a VIX below 20 was good and was cool and was nice. And now we're trading around 13. It's not even the lowest level. So let me see what that is. So here, here is below 13, 1285 for a VIX. That's unheard of, maybe not, because it actually happened. But as you can see, it's, it's an extremely low level that is hardly ever seen before. Now, if we move to sector rotation uh, as it's playing out at the moment, I want to focus on um, financials, industrials, discretionary tech and communication services, as these seem to be the driving forces at the moment. Uh, we talked about how the rotation out of defense towards offensive is going on. So um, not much has changed there. That story still stands. 
If I look at the chart for the industrials index, and as you remember, this was one of the sectors that was pushing to a new all-time high, a new all-time closing high on the monthly charts, and it's holding up that, um, that strong break. That is a good thing. Um, so as long as XLI holds, let's say above the range of 102 and a half, 105, that sector has all to win for. And as you can see from a relative perspective, it's still working to get out of the doldrums. And you can see how that is translating uh, on the RRG as a tail that's moving, picking up a lot of relative momentum, but has only just started to move to the right on the RS ratio scale, which basically means that it is starting to pick up in terms of relative strength. So that is a sector that I would definitely keep an eye on. Um, from a buying perspective, because this is a sector that has a lot of upward potential when you compare it to the three sectors that are already on the right-hand side of the RRG graph. If we look at financials, it's way on the left, but it's picking up and it's starting to move to the right. If you look at the, the price chart for financials, it's still in that range, but it's starting to improve. So within the range, I think that financials, XLF, can actually move to the resistance zone between 36 and 37. That's where it will become very hard and that's where the sector will need to prove itself. Um, so from a price perspective, there is probably around 10%, a little bit less than 10% upside potential. From a relative perspective, you can see that the decline, the speed of the decline is leveling off. That's what's causing the, the tail to move into that improving quadrant. And we now have to wait and see whether we can turn this relative strength line back up towards an uptrend and that will drive financials all the way to the leading quadrant. This is a very early stage uh, and we need to, uh, there, a lot more is needed uh, in both price and relative. But, you know, in the early stages of a move, uh, the best opportunities arise. So this is a bit risky. But with the upside potential within the range and the potential turnaround in terms of relative strength, I'd keep an eye on this one. And then we go to the leading quadrant. And the first one that we see here with the highest relative momentum is consumer discretionary. This sector has gone through a stellar move. And you can see how after that break, uh, hardly any declines happened. We Last week, we took out this overhead resistance here. That was one... Um, previous high around 172 and a half. We continue to push higher. Relative strength is losing a bit of momentum, but not much. The strength is definitely still there. And as you can see here on the price chart, we're looking for resistance around 187 and a half. And because of the high relative momentum, it's very well possible that XLY will start to lose on the RS momentum scale but still move to the right on the RS ratio scale. And that's a good thing because it means that we're still picking up relative strength. We're just not doing it as fast as we used to. Um, so please keep that in mind. This is a sector where there are plenty of industry groups and a lot of individual, individual stocks that uh, could provide you with opportunities. If you go to the ROG chart, run the members of XLY, uh, you can do your own research uh, and see if you can find interesting rotations within that sector because that sector in itself is actually really, really strong. And then I want to go to technology. That's also a sector that's pushing to new all-time highs and that it did it already last week. And this is today. So this is Monday the 17th. That, this today's trading range. Uh, we're actually closing right now. It's 10 p.m. for me. So it's the end of the closing. Um, it's the end of the market for, um, for today in the U.S. And, and we're holding up. We're, we're following through on that breakout to new highs to higher levels and XLK in the technology sector. As you can see, in terms of relative strength, it has been going sort of sideways recently. That's why that green RS momentum line started to come down and move sideways. It looks as if we're picking up again, so that would be really, really strong. No matter what happens here, even if that tail starts to roll over and lose a bit of momentum, there is still uh, a very strong chart, price chart, that's backing up this sector uh, from a positive perspective. And then finally, the communication services sector, 
We all know that this sector has been driving, has been leading the market. You can see how the tail has moved into weakening. So it's coming off the highs right now. And that's why that's because of the RS momentum line moving sideways since uh, mid-May already. So that's uh, May, June, June. So it's like two months. And that's causing that momentum line to move over to roll back down below 100. But look at how high that RS ratio line is. Um, so whenever that RS, RS relative strength line, raw relative strength line, sorry, is picking up again, that will pull, that will push the RS momentum back above 100, and that will start to push RS ratio back up. And what you will see then is a rotation of XLC inside the weakening quadrant, back up to leading. Uh, and as, and what, we're, what we'd be looking for then in terms of price is taking out overhead resistance, which is, it's a bit of a rough area. So I'm looking for the lows here, that's around 70. And then there is this flimmer of resistance here on the upside at 70. So between 70 and 71, that's the resistance area for XLC. If that gets taken out, all the way higher, uh, potentially going to, uh, to highs that we saw in August, 2021. I need to check whether that is all time high levels. Yep, that is all time high levels as you can see right here. So um, XLC going through a relative pause, but it's still one of the stronger sectors, I would say. Another thing that I wanna to discuss today is the perception or the narrative that's been going around for quite some time that the current rally in the S&P is based on very narrow breadth, that only a handful of stocks are driving the market higher. And that was true, was being the operative word here. Because if you look at the chart here, that blue line is the number of stocks inside the S&P that's trading above their 50-day 50 expo 50 exponential moving average. And the black line here is the percentage gain of the S&P 500. And the red line here is the percentage gain of the New York FANG. And I'm using the New York FANG index as that, that little group of mega cap stocks that was driving the market higher. And you can see how that works here. So we're coming out of 2022, obviously being a pretty negative period for the markets. Uh, and then we start rising and you can see how uh, strength of the New York FANG index is picking up and how especially in the first few months that number of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average was declining going to a low of 16%. So at this point in time only 16% of the stocks in the S&P 500 was trading above its 50-day moving average. Um, obviously the New York FANG did a lot better, S&P did not do much. But then from March onward, you can see a first move higher, then it comes down, you can see a higher move. And especially since the end of May, you can see that the, uh, the S&P has been playing catch up with the New York FANG index. And that's what, been, what we've been seeing in those rotations where money is moving out of defense into offense. And if we look inside offense, that, um, small and mid cap stocks are actually catching up with the large cap stocks. And that's exactly what this chart is showing you. You can see how um, from a low in March of 16%, today, 82, more than 80% of stocks in the S&P 500 is trading above its 50 day moving average. That's a lot of stocks. That's about 400 stocks that are trading above their 50 day moving average. If you take that as a measure of breadth, then I think that the S&P is well covered in terms of breadth. And you can see how the S&P actually is playing catch up with that um, small mega cap or smaller in terms of, of size and uh, number of stocks, New York FANG index. So the story, the perception that the current rally is based on very narrow breadth, I think that ship has sailed actually. And then to wrap up this episode of Sector Spotlight, I'd like to point you to the latest RRG blog article, <clears throat> which is titled Low Vol to High Beta Stocks uh, Rotation is Surging. And 
you hear me talk about rotation, offensive, defense, etc. Um, risk on, risk off, and there are there is a variation of metrics that we can use for that. Obviously, there's the sector rotation, offensive, defensive. Uh, you can look at XLY versus XLP, consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. Uh, but one of the one of the metrics that I like to to use, or at least keep in the back of my mind, is the relationship between low volatility and high beta stocks. Um, they're probably very roughly the same as growth and value, just taking a slightly different angle. And if things start to confirm each other, and if you can see the same message coming from a lot of these uh, different metrics, then you, you can feel more comfortable about what's going on. And the rotation of high beta versus low vol is actually doing exactly that. There's two ETFs that I use for that. That's SPHB and SPLV. Uh, and those are Invesco, um, the, the Invesco S&P high beta and the Invesco S&P low volatility. And you can see, you can read the article, it's in the blog, but I would quickly want to point out what's happening here because this is the weekly RRG, which is very clearly in favor of high beta versus low vol. Um, please note that I'm using the equal weight version of the S&P 500 as the benchmark because these, these, the construction of these ETFs is that every quarter they take the 100 uh, stocks with the highest beta and they take 100 stocks with the lowest vol that go into SPLV and they're 1% each at the rebalancing date. So it gives a pretty, pretty good evenly spread um, representation of high beta stocks and low vol stocks. And you can see how that rotation has gradually improved in favor of high beta. If we move that to a daily chart, um, then you can actually see how that rotation has completed on the right and the left hand side. So I'm gonna play that out. You can see how that rotation that we currently see is now moving and we know when they when they rotate on the right hand or on the left hand side that's an indication of a very strong relative tra relative trend and that's what's happening with uh, high beta and the opposite is true for low vol but watch this if we look at the monthly version of this chart then you see the similar picture but high beta is still in improving and low vol is, is still in weakening but they're rapidly approaching each other so on all three time frames monthly weekly and daily high beta is crushing low volatility if you take high beta versus low vol as a risk on risk off metric then this is this metric this this um, high beta low vol metric is sending a very clear message of risk on and that's it for this week. Please remember Sector Spotlight is available on demand on the stockcharts.com YouTube channel. I attempt to upload a new episode at the beginning of each week, aiming for Mondays. Uh, you're still very welcome to share your thoughts, ideas, or comments on any of the handles that you can see on the screen. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. I'm looking forward, I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week, same time, same place.